Good afternoon, and welcome to the myth of the magical messaging fabric. I uh, hope that you're all coffeeed up and uh, are a little bit refreshed after dealing with concurrency models and all sorts of interesting things like that. My name is Jacob Karab. I am an, in an independent consultant uh, working in the area of integration and messaging. Uh, I work primarily with a number of Apache products. My work involves everything from architecture all the way through to troubleshooting. Uh, I'm the guy that people call when their messaging systems are on fire or just not working or clogged. I'm also a Bristolian now. Uh, how, many, how many people are from Bristol? Yay, yeah, good turnout, good turnout. Fantastic. Everyone else, welcome. So let, let's talk about messaging. Uh, messaging is very hard to get excited about. Um, it lacks the shininess of things like NIO frameworks and containers and, and microservices. And the reason for that is that fundamentally it's plumbing. And it's kind of tangential to our everyday work, and it's just kind of something that has to be done when you're gluing systems together. On a worst case scenario, it's something that you fight on a regular basis. Uh, it suffers from capacity problems, it suffers from back pressure from downstream systems, and every once in a while you get these mysterious issues slowing down message flow for no apparent reason. Does it sound at all familiar? Yeah. Uh, the best case scenario is it simply sits in the background running, which isn't that great either. Because the people who set it up and have actually understood it over a number of years have left your company, which leaves everyone else with partial information about just their view of this thing leaving them scratching their heads. So it's no wonder that we start telling ourselves myths about it. The people who work with messaging don't necessarily understand how it works. And unless you have to drill deeply into it, often because of production problems, we start telling ourselves stories about how these things should behave. And it starts with one lie. It's just a pipe. For a lot of people, this is where the hand-waving starts. But if you actually start taking a look closely and seeing what's going on inside it, you'll find that there's actually quite a bit more than meets the eye. So it's not uncommon to hear things like, we'll never lose messages. Messages will be processed in order. Adding consumers will make the system go faster. Messages will be delivered once and only once. And we should just be able to add this extra million messages a day. What could possibly go wrong? So by doing this, we instill into something which is everyday and functional mythical magical properties. Inevitably, later on, usually in production, we are disappointed <laughs> with the results. <laughs> to get past this state, we actually have to understand what it is that we're working with. So whether a messaging system can address your particular use cases and how it goes about it depends on its underlying design and the trade-offs that its authors have actually chosen to make. Sometimes they're obvious. Often, though, you need to get a deeper understanding of what's going on inside them, which means usually drilling beyond the front page of the documentation and flashy presentations. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to compare and contrast two products that superficially play in the same space, distribution of messages. They have 
deep differences in approach and use cases. Representing traditional old school message brokers is Apache ActiveMQ. Representing the new Shiny is Apache Kafka. It's distributed, it's cloud-based, it's amazing. I'm not going to explain these things in detail because it's impossible to do over the time frame that we've got available to us. But what my goal is really is to highlight to you through the differences in approach, the ideas that you need to start thinking about when you start looking at messaging systems so that you can intelligently critique them in the future. So let's take a look at ActiveMQ. But before we do that, let's take a step back and go, why do we need a messaging system in the first place? When we have two systems that talk to each other, we separate them out by an interface, by a common interface so that one can talk to the other. Pretty straightforward. So why would you put a, a counterparty, in, uh, an intermediary party into the mix? Well, it's to add another layer of separation. It's what's called temporal separation, separation over time. So that if A wants to communicate with B, B doesn't necessarily have to be there at that particular point in time in order to receive it. Think of it like the post office. If I send you a parcel, you don't actually need to be at home in order for me to be able to send the parcel in the first place. So what exactly are messaging systems? Well, messaging systems typically look like this. They have two fundamental components, a server-side component, in this case represented by a broker, and also a client-side component, which knows how to talk to that server over a common interface, which is known as a wire format. Usually, there's probably some form of API over the top of that, although there may or may not be, depending on the, the implementation of the client library. So let's take a look at, at ActiveMQ and just go, okay, well, what exactly are these, these wire formats that this particular broker supports? So we've got an internal one called OpenWire, which is used for its JMS, CMS, and NMS libraries for Java, C++, and .NET. It has, it supports AMQP, which is a standard messaging format so that you can use, for example, uh, Apache Cupid Proton libraries to communicate to it from C++ or Python. Uh, there are various other implementations in other languages. There is Stomp, which is a text-based uh, text based protocol. MQTT for Internet of Things devices. XMPP, in case you want to talk to your message broker like a chat room. Some people do. Um, or WebSockets. So if you want to have a JavaScript application that's talking directly into a broker, then this is the way to go. So ActiveMQ supports two primary messaging domains. The first one, and the most commonly used one, is point-to-point -point messaging represented by queues. This is a first-in, first-out data structure that is durable. What exactly is durability? Durability, simply described, is not no consumer, no problem. If a consumer isn't connected when they connect, they receive any messages that were sent while they were, while they were gone. In the case of a, a broker, messages are persistent if the, if the sender wants those messages to be persisted. The other domain that we deal with is publish, subscribe, and topics. And the, the best way to uh, describe this is it's a bit like a conference call. Any number of people can join. One person is speaking, everybody hears. If someone drops off, then they're not going to hear part of the conversation. When they resume, they've, they've just kind of missed it. They're non-durable by default, but they can be made durable. Uh, durable subscriptions can also take advantage of persistence. Durability and persistence are two different properties. So all uh, systems, all, all network-based uh, systems that deal, with, uh, that deal with storage have to deal with one particular trade-off. It's what I term the reliability versus performance trade-off. And it's a spectrum. You have reliability on one hand and performance on the other. By default, ActiveMQ is set to uh, a default which is dictated by a standard that it complies with, JMS. The JMS default 
moves the arrow on this particular spectrum all the way over to reliability. But it is actually tunable. So you can bring it all the way to performance, or you can put somewhere in the middle. There is a trade-off. You want it to be really performant? It's going to be a bit unreliable. So to understand how brokers behave, in particular around, uh, around queues, what we need to do is to talk about how they actually go about storing messages. This happens in a journal. A journal is a persisted data structure, which sits in your file system, which contains a history of interactions with the system spanning multiple files. In the case of ActiveMQ, it stores both messages and acknowledgments. So how exactly does queue production work relative to this journal? Well, we have a sending thread kind of coming down through, the, uh, through the, the application that you're currently using, and it calls into a producer construct. And the producer construct sends a message over to ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ goes off and writes the messages to a journal. But then what it needs is some sort of confirmation that this thing has actually been written in. Once it gets confirmation, it sends an acknowledgement back and the thread is able to continue. Out of this entire conversation, this confirm step is the single most time consuming step in the entire interaction. Why? Well, if I'm writing to a disk, I may not actually have written to a disk. You see, a regular system has caches everywhere. These caches are described in only one place, clearly on one page that I know of. It's in the Postgres documentation, chapter 29.1, Reliability. It's the only place. So what are these systems? And what are their purposes? If I write something to a file, it's probably hit an operating system buffer cache. This caches frequently read blocks and combines disk writes. Underneath that sits a drive controller cache. Some of these caches are write through. Some of them are write back. Usually they're volatile. If you turn off the power switch, you lose anything that's in it. Okay. Then you get to a disk drive cache. Again, some are write through, some are write back. Consumer drives and SSDs, which are actually the thing that gets used most of the time, are both write back and volatile. Turn off the power switch, it's gone. So most of the signals for buffer interactions are only available to the file system. From Java, which is what ActiveMQ is used for, we have to call an operation called sync, which forces all the system buffers to synchronize with the underlying device. Okay. So let's talk about the disk performance factors. and Why is this particular thing so slow and what could limit it? The disk is the primary limiter of performance inside a messaging system like this. <coughs> So let's talk about this through, the, through a, a, much, a very much simplified mental model of a pipe. I want to write things. Those instructions have to go through a pipe. The number of instructions per second I can use is called IOPS. This is a bit of a fudgy number, and you'll never get anyone agreeing as to what exactly it is, because it's only an approximation. And there are a number of different IOPS measurements. They depend on whether you're doing reads, whether you're doing writes, or whether you're doing a combination of the two, whether those reads or writes are sequential, or whether they're random access. Okay. The length of the pipe is the overall latency. So how long does it take to take that instruction and actually send it to disk? The width of the pipe is the actual carrying capacity. How big can the messages be? The overall throughput that you can get between a high-level process and a disk will be defined by the first of these limits to be hit. Internally within the broker, we actually hit contention. So if you've been paying attention to the previous presentations, you'll, you'll have heard this a number of times. 
If I have three producers sending messages to three different queues, at some point they have to guarantee some form of mutual exclusion amongst each other in order so that you don't get three things at the same time updating the same file. Okay. So there is, uh, there is a degree of contention within the, the broker's storage engine. The upside of this design choice is that it's actually very easy to, to kind of to implement transactions within the broker itself. So an, a transaction might look like this. The producer sends a message to a QA, to QB, to QC, and then goes commit. At that point in time, a single write goes through to the, the disk, and it does a confirmation back and acknowledges. So you get orders of magnitude performance gains as a, the writes are condensed into a single operation that, that goes down to disk, and you only need confirmation at the end. So there's some opportunities for optimization within the client library itself. The other nice thing about this entire scheme, depending on the APIs that, that, you're, that you're dealing with, some of them can actually tie into broader transaction management APIs like JTA for example. So you can tie it into to XA and all that sort of um, kind of working stuff. I say kind of working, there's a pub story behind that. So let's, let's see how Q consumption actually works. Well, when I get a consumer connecting into a system, it says I'd like some messages from a Q. ActiveMQ pages messages in from the journal and dispatches them into an in intermediary buffer inside the client library. The consuming threads actually consume directly out of that buffer. <coughs> At some point in time, you'll get an acknowledgement back. The relationship between the consumption and the acknowledgement are de defined on a, a per consumer basis. Okay? Although transactional consumption is generally the, the applied model here. Once ActiveMQ has gotten confirmation, it takes the message out of memory. This the, keeps a thing called a, a dispatch queue and it marks it as being eligible for deletion. So acknowledgments themselves are stored in the journal and uh, so that the broker knows the overall state of the queues that are within those journals at startup. Fairly straightforward. Uh, journals with uh, no unconsumed messages are deleted periodically, okay? generally once every 30 seconds. So how does it deal with multiple consumers on a queue? Well, if I send in four messages, I've just marked them as red and blue, no relationship to each other necessarily, you, you'll see that they just get round robin dispatched. So the red messages go to consumer one, the blue messages go to consumer two. Okay, so what happens if one of these consumers fails? So these, these messages are sitting inside a buffer inside the client library. Well, ActiveMQ is keeping track of who's currently got the messages, who they've been dispatched to, and who they're waiting for responses on. It aggressively keeps track of how many consumers there are and who is currently connected. When it notices that a, that a consumer has gone down, the messages themselves are redispatched off to the next consumer. Fairly straightforward. Now, th th there's a, a little bit of a, a gotcha around this moment, because the broker doesn't actually know what's going on with the message inside the consumer the consumer may have pulled a message out of the buffer and called a web service. And then the system shut down. Downstream, that web service has changed its state. However, the message itself is going to be redispatched, And the next consumer is also going to call the, the next web service. So this is one of the greatest myths about messaging, that you can get once and only once delivery. It's not the case. It's not the case at all. It's a unicorn requirement. So how exactly does broker reliability work? Well, ActiveMQ is, is very much a, kind of a traditional master-slave type failover mechanism. Act it uses the, uh, the storage mechanism itself as an arbiter of who is eligible to write to it. So the first broker that starts up gets a handle on the, on the store, gets a lock on it, and says, Great, I can now open my ports and start accepting connections. The second broker to, to start up, in this case, this is called broker B, it connects and goes, oh, I can't, I can't get access to the store, so what I'll do is I'll just poll it, just periodically, and just see whether I can. It doesn't know how many other 
active MQ physical instances there are at this point in time to, um, you know, within its logical grouping. So, the, so here you have two physical brokers actually making up one single logical broker. On the client side, the client has the location of the hosts that it's, that it's interested, host A and host B, the physical brokers that make up the logical broker. And it alternates between them until it can connect to one with an open port, which is the master. Now in this particular setup, disk access matters. For storage, you need to set up shared disks between the two instances somewhere. Aside from setting up the shared disk, you need to guarantee exclusive access to those disks so that process X over here, which is sitting completely on the side, isn't causing disk contention. Because if something's trying to write to the disk at the same time that you're writing to the disk, all of a sudden your broker is mysteriously slow. What's going on? This is a big problem in virtualized environments without something called storage affinity. What you need to do is you need to guarantee a clear run at the disk. And by a clear run, I mean also the networking between yourself and the server that actually holds the disk in it. If you're trying to guarantee two physical brokers, not you know one fall, you want to allow one of them to fall over, then you need the storage to be somewhere else. So there is a network involved in there as well. This particular setup is not a very good fit for containers. Some people have tried running ActiveMQ inside uh, inside things like Docker, and it's not a great fit. Why? Because of the file system setups and the way that you know the the networking needs to be kind of cuddled like a pet, like a kitten. Uh, it needs a manual box setup. So you're trying to marry up two things that aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily gel together. Some companies have tried this. Uh, the big one is Salesforce, and they've just gone, anything that talks to storage, we're not chucking it into a container at all. Yeah? All of the kind of the compute nodes, yeah, dockerize them, put them onto some sort of weird orchestration services, whatever, it doesn't really matter. So <clears throat> because we're so tied to the disk, we can't run this anywhere. It's very, very specific as to, as to where it is. So what happens if you want to scale this, uh, scale this up and out? Well, the first one is you can increase the disk speed. Self-explanatory. You can make use, better use of the disk dimensions. So you can actually combine writes into a single write. Uh, if you've got high latency, like you have in uh, EC2 on uh, EBS, their latency is something like two milliseconds for a write, which means that you have a theoretical maximum of somewhere around 500 messages per second, if you think about it in those terms, without the broker contention being involved. So anything that you can kind of do to combine that is, is, a, is a good thing. Um, you can also split the messaging out over multiple brokers. So you might have some queues on some brokers, other queues on other brokers. The biggest anti-pattern that I see when I go out on the site is what I refer to as the big bag of messaging, where you just take a whole bunch of systems and you go, yeah, everything should be able to talk to anything else. And then you go off and you build a physical broker infrastructure out of this, uh, which is kind of a naive way of looking at it, uh, because fundamentally, ActiveMQ should be thought of as a layer in this particular instance. If you replaced the word AMQ here with Oracle, would you expect that to be a single Oracle server? Probably not. You'd probably be talking about some, something else. So some thought is required. So what are the trade-offs around this thing? Well, ActiveMQ is, has a very simple model, almost too simple. You can download it. You can run it. And it works for a while, which leads to it's just a pipe thinking. And it works for about six months until it stops. It's transactional. Yeah, you can consume messages transactionally. You can send them transactionally. And it has a rich set of supporting functionality. ActiveMQ isn't just a dumb pipe that you chuck some stuff in and get some messages out. There are things like message routing and filtering, wiretapping, broker networks for spanning geographical locations, etc. So what are the downsides of this thing? Uh, 
Well, your performance is pinned to disks, fundamentally. <clears throat> it's impacted by the total load on the broker. If something's going on in one queue, you'll see another queue slow down, which is a bit odd to a newcomer. It requires non-transparent changes to the broker topology. Sometimes you'll actually have to go into your application and say, oh, actually, we're going to need to move these queues out to somewhere else and introduce another, say, connection factory if you're talking through JMS. So the triggers for this change are changes in uh, traffic volumes, number of destinations, payload sizes, all of these types of things. And fundamentally, it requires an understanding of the internal mechanics and some upfront thought to get right. And there are a lot of features, and some of these features conflict with each other. It's as simple as that. So let's talk Kafka. What are some of Kafka's goals? Well, fundamentally, Kafka is supposed to be fast. Really, really, really fast. It does this because it needs to handle huge volumes of data. What do I mean by huge? You're talking hundreds and thousands and millions of messages per second across clusters. So it needs to scale horizontally. It needs to support pub-sub and point-to-point, -point, and it needs to be durable. Also, it has to allow for replays. In order to know this, you have to understand kind of where they were coming from originally. I'll get to that later. In order to do this, it has a unified destination model, which they've conveniently named a topic which conflicts with what everyone else understands as a topic. So I'll, I'll disambiguate it by calling it a Kafka topic. A Kafka topic is both a topic and a queue. It is, a, it is composed of one journal with multiple pointers to internal locations. Unlike ActiveMQ, Kafka separates out individual destinations into their own journals. So what exactly is this pointer? So a pointer is my way of talking about it. It's okay, you can make up your own words when they make more sense. So it corresponds to a single logical consumer, which means a system. Okay? Not a consuming thread within a system. A system. A single logical system. It is documented as a consumer group. In the code, however, what you'll see is it being referred to as a group ID. Think of it as just a pointer. So how exactly does a, a Kafka topic actually work? Well, having n number of pointers means that a Kafka topic acts as a queue, where you've only got one consumer, <coughs> or it acts as a topic when you've got two or many pointers. So if I've got one pointer and one consumer, I will see Kafka distributing messages over to that consumer. Now what happens if I get two consumers using the same pointer? Well, only one thing can control a pointer. So what Kafka does is it says, OK, well, the latest consumer is going to take over the message flow. It's kind of like a consumer priority feature or kind of an exclusive consumer where the newest consumer has the highest priority and it just takes over. And this is completely different from JMS queues, and really confusing to newcomers. Because ActiveMQ dispatches messages in a round-robin fashion, kind of just splitting them out 50-50. Yep. So what does the Kafka documentation say about it? Well, it goes, well, one option that you have is to use what's called a multiplexing consumer. So if you want to process messages in parallel, you use one consumer, you pull all the messages into one node and split it out between multiple threads. Now, in reality, there's only very limited amount of use cases that, that you can apply that sort of thing for. Why? Because the crash of the consumer process will drop any messages that are currently in flight, that have been put into its intermediate buffer. So Kafka provides another option, partitioning. Within partitioning, messages for one topic get split out over multiple journals. You can kind of think of them as shards. 
Okay. So what happens if I have uh, one consumer per partition? Well, each consumer instance controls its named pointer in its assigned partition. So here's system A for consumer 1 and system A for consumer 2 in their relative partitions. If I have less consumers than I have partitions, multiple partitions are assigned to one consumer. And it will consume one and then the other partition. So partitioning. Where exactly does this happen? Well, it's performed by the producer. The producer has to decide which partition to send it into. So before we talk about partitioning, let's consider what we're actually sending. ActiveMQ uses something called a message. A message is a mutable data structure, which contains some metadata in the, as headers, and also a payload. Kafka, on the other hand, a message is a key value pair. The value is the payload. And the key is a business-specific grouping used for partitioning, and it corresponds to a set of messages that should be processed in order. So this might be something like an account number or a geographical location or similar. The value in this case is the payload. So what we need is some sort of a function that given a message and the current cluster state for a topic. What do I mean by the current cluster state of a topic? Well, a topics, the number of partitions inside a topic can actually change at runtime. You can add partitions onto a topic. So every single time you call a partitioning function, you have to look up the cluster state of, hey, how many partitions do I actually have to choose from? Okay. So a partitioner interface is the way that this is, that this is implemented, where you can actually implement your own partition strategy for this. So given a topic, uh, a key, a value, and the current cluster, return me a partition ID. The default implementation of this uses a hash function. Now, the problem with this is that you get, an, you get uneven distribution due to hash collisions, especially amongst a small number of partitions. You also get in-order consumption problems when you're adding or deleting partitions at runtime. So if I add a partition, messages that were previously assigned to one partition will probably go to another partition, or could go to another partition. So they could be processed out of order. So generally, it's kind of a hairy thing to be adding partitions at runtime to a running system unless you've really, really tested this. So if you want to write your own partitioning uh, strategy, what sorts of con uh, considerations do you need? Well. The first and foremost, you need to ensure that all related messages end up on the same partition. You'd probably like to deal with some sort of evenness of messenger distribution. And you might need to deal with stickiness of a key to a partition. Why stickiness? Well, if I add a partition, I still want all related messages that have been sent to a previous partition to still keep going to that same partition if I want to guarantee if I want to guarantee ordering. Now the problem with this is stickiness implies state, and it's fine if you've got a number of producers inside the same process. However, if you've got producers across different, say, Java virtual machines, then they need to be able to communicate the current state of their stickiness amongst each other. So you probably need something like an in-memory data grid in order to do this reliably. So now we're talking reliable data grid, uh, in-memory data grids. So why, why? Well, it's to support a fair distribution of messages to multiple consumers <coughs> without the broker incurring the cost of managing dispatch. So Kafka rephrases this kind of distribution dispatch problem to being one of partitioning. And it devolves it from something that it normally would otherwise have to do during the distribution of messages. It devolves that responsibility back to the producer, which means you. Good stuff. So what other complexity is there in sending messages? Well, here we have a producer interface from the, the uh, Kafka APIs. 
And we've got a send method, and it, it takes a key and a value. And you can, uh, it returns to you a future. You should be very, very careful about things that return futures. Why? Because it implies that there's a buffer of some sort in the middle. And here we have a thread that goes down, sends a message into a buffer, and then there's a second thread that sends the messages off to the broker in the first place. So if the system shuts down, this thread's merrily gone along on its way, thinking that it's sent a message, but in reality it hasn't. So you know, what do you do? Can you replay? Don't know. Well, at least it's fast. You can tune it to be more reliable by, say, setting the buffer size to zero or making the call synchronous and waiting for the future. And that should be all that we have to worry about, right? Well, not, not quite. So if you take a look at the consumer and you say, OK, well, what's the complexity of, of consuming messages? The consumption is, consumption is done through polling. And polling gives you a set of messages, a plural. Let's look at the poll operation. We have a journal, and we want to send a number of messages to a consumer. So we've got a pointer. We move that pointer across at some point in time. We send, uh, we send the, messages, the messages through. The pointer movement actually happens, I think, just a little bit after the, the messages have been sent. Now, the problem is the pointer has already moved, and it has no relation to whether the, the messages themselves were actually processed. It's just a pointer movement. Right? So a crash in this case means that we have no idea what just happened. If you get another, another system, another consumer coming online or taking over that particular partition or journal, it has no idea that a failure happened, which is a little bit problematic. So fundamentally, consumption here is non-transactional. You need to keep track of the last consumed pointer position yourself. And when you get assigned a partition, you have to rewind to the last known offset of that particular thing. So it implies some sort of external state which is shared between consumer instances. And there's a, there's a method for rewinding uh, on the actual consumer interface. Alternatively, you can keep track of the messages that you've processed. On partition assignment, just rewind all the way back to the beginning. Process the messages and discard the previously seen messages. This is a well-known pattern. It's called an idempotent consumer. It's an enterprise integration pattern. Or you could just keep your consumer code very, very simple and only use Kafka when there is some message loss acceptable. Now, the, the key point to be made here is that Kafka actually hasn't lost your messages. You just didn't process them. So how does it deal with resiliency? Well, if you remember ActiveMQ, we were talking about a very traditional kind of master-slave shared storage system. It's, it's old school. It's, very, it's analogous to a, a relational database. Kafka, on the other hand, is very much cloud-first, running on simple commodity hardware. None of this shared file system nonsense. It's the, effectively the NoSQL of messaging. Each Kafka topic here has a master and slave Kafka instances with replication between them. You define the actual replication factor, how many different Kafka instances are involved on a per topic basis. So it's kind of like turn the entire thing upside down. The, the upside of this is that Kafka actually runs a multi-master system. So in a cluster of four boxes, as is the case here, some nodes can be masters for some topics and slaves for others, such as the Kafka 2 instance here. So coordination, the decision of who exactly is master-slave, is left up to a system called Zookeeper, which is a distributed runtime registry. It also stores the journal offsets the that the consumer groups are up to. So the implication of this is that you have no need for a shared infrastructure, which is awesome. And there is no need to sync, so you don't wear that really, really high cost. Why? If you've sprayed the data out to a number of different systems at the same time, they can just write that at their leisure. 
if I wasn't doing a, a sync and I was looking at a Linux node, for example, and running a system called uh, a program called IOSTAT, I would see that non-synced writes actually get flushed to the disk about once every 15 seconds. So if you've ever wondered why that eject button exists on the USB and why the computer always complains about it, same problem. So the, what are the, what are the trade-offs that, that you get which are, are positive about this? Well, it's easily scalable, add nodes. You get a very high throughput due to the actual, the underlying resiliency design, and it's easy to run on commodity infrastructure. Now, what are the downsides? Well, it's non-transactional. You have lots of client complexity that needs to be re-implemented across systems and languages. You, you're probably running in a polyglot environment. So if I've got Python and Java, that same logic have, needs to be implemented in both. You need lots and lots of disks because Kafka doesn't delete journals in the same way that ActiveMQ does. It simply deletes journals older than X, which means that if you haven't consumed those messages by that time, you are hosed. And it requires an understanding of the internal mechanics and some upfront thought to get right. Uh, just an, another point to make about the, the lots of disk. If I, have, uh, if I want to tolerate consumer outages, I need to calculate how much disk space I'll need on a per minute basis and multiply it out over the outage window. So it's not uncommon to see an outage window of, say, you know, six hours requiring something like 150 gigabytes of disk, which if anyone's ever priced that sort of thing on Amazon, you'll probably see that that gets really, really expensive really quickly. So what works for you? So when would you use ActiveMQ? Well, the use cases here are very broad. You care about not missing messages, and you want them processed in order. It's, this sort of thing usually applies for high individual, high individual value messages. Kafka doesn't actually lose messages, you might not process them. ActiveMQ can group related messages uh, as well. You want non-durable publish subscribe. Not everything should be written to disk. Publish subscribe uh, use cases tend to be very, very high volume. Uh, and just because disk is commodity doesn't necessarily mean that it's cheap. SANS are expensive, so is EBS over time. And consumer outages can cause backlogs. You might use it when you have messages that have a use by date, when you want them to be actually expired. ActiveMQ deals with that sort of problem. You can use a broker as a transport bridge. So if you've got a JavaScript application running inside a broker, a browser, talking, um, a talking stomp over web sockets, and it, it communicates in the back end somewhere over there with a C++ plank talking AMQP. You can do request reply over messaging, a bit smelly. There's a lot of failure use cases there. Um, it does some simple message routing and it spans geographical locations. When would you use Kafka? When you've got messaging that is valuable in aggregate, so things like user activities, log aggregation, UI performance, diagnostic events, clicks, um, the more data you have, the less you generally care about any individual bit of it. So some, some message loss is acceptable. You'd use it when there's a huge throughput of data. If you're looking at hundreds of thousands or millions of messages per second, you should probably be looking at this first. Or if you're trying to implement CQRS. CQRS is a, um, is a, a service style, I suppose. Um, that allows you to have replays. So in conclusion, horses don't fly. Neither system covers transactionality, consumer failure awareness, uh, co sorry, covers all of these, storage, um, transparent scalability, storage independence, or plug and play in production. If nothing fits all of these things, well, maybe we're entering the age of polyglot messaging. Regardless of which system you end up using, 
You should understand the tools, dig underneath, learn the coordinate cases, learn the trade-offs, and use the right tool for the job. Thank you very much.